Um, and that's why we do these the way that we do them. So if you're watching this, you're watching raw footage. When this goes to post-production, none of this craziness will be uh, will be in there. And so let me give, give you a minute to catch my breath here. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to another installment of The Brew, uh, a weekly talk show that explores the magical and esoteric and, and healing uh, and mystic uh, spiritual practices outside of the context of pop culture, uh, witchcraft, or magic, if you will, uh, that uh, for much of the last, uh, uh, much of the 20th century and, and all of the 21st century has led to our experiencing a conflation that exists between the, uh, the concept of the old ways, the ancient traditions and, and folk magic traditions of the craft of the wise, and the old religion, which is really a, a somewhat foolish attempt to, to pretend that prior to the emergence of the Roman Empire uh, and its church, there was only one religion, one old religion. Um, you know, that's, that's a concept that Gerald Gardner and some of his contemporaries largely put forth in the late 40s, early 50s. And hopefully what we're going to do tonight is going to be to inspire some of you to uh, consider maybe expanding the, the mental space you've given to the concept in which um, magical and esoteric practices can fit in a much broader, much more diverse um, environment. So tonight I'm really fortunate to be joined by a group of scholars and academics experienced and new practitioners of uh, Catholic Conjure and folk magic, um, including one of our faculty members at the Interapomy Mystery School, um, an academic and personal empowerment coach, uh, a SUNY professor, um, that, uh, that should, I should say SUNY in New York, not SUNY from, uh, from the Middle East, uh, and uh, uh, another longtime practitioner that uh, I've been looking forward to talking to. Um, who practices in uh, Catholic Conjure and Southern Conjure. Um, so it's going to be a great conversation, and we'll dive in when we get back. And welcome back, everybody. Uh, I would just ask that if you're in an area that's uh, uh, that's a little noisy, I'll go ahead and mute yourself till you're ready to chat. Um, and uh, and for those who are tuning in for the first time, this is a live and interactive show. Um, I, I generally say that so that I remember to open the uh, the comment section and keep an eye there. But if you have any comments that you want to share, um, any questions uh, for our panel today. Um, be sure to do that, and we'll try and get those up on the screen as well. Uh, but before we do that, I want to go ahead and uh, sort of go around the room uh, because I, I really meant it in the introduction. Um, this this uh, episode began with Michael and I talking about, uh, you know, doing a show to talk about his great work with the uh, at, at the uh, Institute, um, but also to, to talk about widening and expanding the tent uh, to include more people, and as it so happened, some some various folks in the community um, caught my eye, and and we've had con some of us have had conversations, um, and that led us to this group we have tonight. So, uh, Michelle Thompson, let's go ahead and start with you, uh, and and tell us, Doctor, what your background is, what led you to the uh, uh, to the esoteric path. Uh, and, uh, and and why you thought you might want to jump in and talk about Catholic Conjure with us. Well, aside from being the obvious glutton for punishment <laughs> as a prior lawyer and, um, and a current scholar, um, I I used to be, I was raised evangelical, um, which is confined to me in many ways, especially if you identify as, I don't know, lesbian. Um, and it was, it was years, it took years for me to go, oh, I think, this, I think I want to be Catholic. I think, and I felt, it's a longer story, but I felt called to the Virgin Mary for years. And so that actually opened up um, 
a space that that just actually coming to the Catholic Church actually opened up a space for me that I hadn't had before in my own spiritual practice. And then last year, I lost both my parents. But after my mother died, I found myself studying. I was obsessed and still am with tarot. And so I started to incorporate that into my practices and then starting to look into some of the more esoteric practices. So it's exciting to be here. Wow. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you. And, uh, and I'm sure we will dive in uh, to some of those topics in a few minutes. Negan, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, about your background as well. And, um, and you know, what led you to, to want to uh, chat with us tonight about Catholic Conjure? Um, okay, so actually, I am a certified nurse midwife and a women's health nurse practitioner. So I'm pretty sciencey um, by nature. And I was raised Roman Catholic. My father is 100% Sicilian. So I grew up in a very, very Italian um, family with Italian Catholic ways. Um, and most of it never really resonated with me, honestly. I, I, there were parts of it that I liked, but I was drawn more and more and more into a more, I guess esoteric is, is a good way to, to say it, a more esoteric space. Um, and by the time I was in my late teens, I had pretty much swung the pendulum the other way and completely um, left Catholicism for a long, long time. Like I just that wasn't what I wanted to do. That wasn't where I wanted to be. Um, I, like her before me, I started reading tarot cards as well and got deep into divination. And now I actually do that professionally on the side. Um, and then I started kind of coming back to more of my hoodoo and my Southern roots because I was raised just outside of the New Orleans area, which fits well, I guess, with Catholic conjure, right, as a, as a whole concept. And so I, I guess that's how I came to be where I am is a combination of how I was brought up where I was brought up and what resonated with me on a soul level. And such powerful, um, uh, you know, synergy too, as we talk about Catholic conjure um, and, and the contributions that the Italian uh, uh, heritage brought to it. <clears throat> the, the heartbeat of that was in New Orleans, where um, some of you have heard me say before, the largest, single largest lynching in, uh, on U.S. soil took place in New Orleans, and it was a, a group of Sicilian uh, people that were uh, were lynched in that lynching. So, so the again we see this convergence of people on whose back uh, and and with whose blood um, a lot of of what we have uh, in the modern era um, without without whom we wouldn't have a lot of what we have in the modern era. So we'll, we'll be talking about that. Thank you, Megan. Uh, let's uh, let's jump over Michael for one second. And uh, Dr. Melissa Lavin, tell us a little bit about uh, you and your work and what led you to uh, to want to be on the uh, on the show. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, John Michael, thank you for your invitation. Uh, so I am a professor at SUNY Oneonta, and I've written in a variety of areas over the years. Uh, I am an advisory editor for the journal Deviant Behavior, and I've written on sex work and juvenile delinquency and research methods. Uh, but now, um, most recently, I have been uh, studying, learning, uh, participating in reading about, uh, and actually reading tarot at psychic fairs, and uh, wrote an article on tarot readers in rural areas, and I'm now writing a book, a much larger project, that's less autoethnographic. I'm an ethnographer, uh, less autoethnographic, and more about talking to a wide variety of other practitioners and believers. And I'm really, I don't have anything to do with Catholic conjure per se, but I am here to learn and I am here to ask questions. Fantastic. <clears throat> um, and that is, that's what we wanted you here for. Uh, Melissa and I just met uh, the other day where we were having a, a, a pretty incredible conversation about uh, the, the esoteric and magical world. So I'm glad you could be here. And Michael, last but not least, uh, tell us about you and what brought you to, uh, to where you are in your path, as well as the, uh, the course that you're teaching now at the Mystery School. Perfect. So first, I want to say it's so great to be speaking with all you lovely ladies tonight. Um, and I'm also very excited that two of you share some of my background 
Um, but a little bit about me, I was raised um, Southern Baptist. Uh, my family is a staunch Baptist family from South Carolina, and that was a lot of my religious experience growing up. Um, when I entered Catholic school around sixth grade, I was brought into a world um, of Italian Catholic devotion, but also very much mixed with Mexican and Puerto Rican um, Catholic devotion also. So there was always a very mystical kind of synergy around me in my Catholic formation. And that's where I began to develop um, a relationship with Mary and the saints and really a various amount of different folk practices, which at the time that I thought was just normal Catholicism. I thought that this was like the standard, like this is what people experience when they're Catholic. And I just kind of went with it. Um, at the age of 18, I decided to convert to Catholicism because of my love of Mary and the saints and continue my studies at St. John's University, um, receiving my bachelor's degree in theology. And it wasn't until I got to uh, college that I realized that this kind of mystical understanding of Catholicism was not the norm and people kind of saw it as weird. Um, and so I went through that time and spent some time in the monastery of the Mercedarians where I met my good friend Scott who is of Sicilian heritage and is also a practitioner of Sicilian Streganoria. And so we got into this long conversation about um, Benedicaria um, in different Italian Catholic folk magic traditions. And he said, I think that this would be a really good fit for you. And I realized that this is very much um, where my life's path was. And this is where my real passion for spirituality and mysticism was. And so I began reading holy cards, which led to reading tarot cards. And it's been my path since. Um, becoming from an ancestral point of view, I also looked into hoodoo um, in studying more kind of Christian leaning um, magical practices, being that being my ancestral roots. Um, but on the Inner Alchemy Academy, what I'm teaching is um, Cry to Heaven, um, Catholic Conjure 101. And what my point is for this class is really to bring Catholic Conjure to a wider cultural audience. It's not that you have to be Sicilian. It's not that you have to be Italian. Um, it's not that you have to be South American to practice this tradition um, that Catholic devotion can be used and integrated into your magical practice from whatever point of view or wherever you come with it, even if you come from a secular background, even if you come from a more Orthodox Christian background or you straddle some line in between like a lot of us do, um, that is what I strive to do on the Inner Alchemy Academy platform. Well, and we're glad to have you here as well and, uh, and so much to unpack. So let's kind of dive in um, from, from the perspective um, and anybody who wants to, uh, uh, you know, wants to speak to, to these questions or if you have any of your own, uh, be sure to ask them. If you're a viewer and you're watching, um, you can go ahead and comment underneath the feed in the show, and we'll be able to put your questions on the screen. But um, I, I question for anybody on the on the panel um, in your <clears throat> personal practice, um, what does that intersectionality look like between the spiritual, the purely esoteric part of your of your practice, and the uh, maybe the religious aspects? And do you see that as being um, a, a barrier? Because I know there's a lot of different views on whether um, our practices should be open or closed or um, what that means. And, and um, uh, I think, you know, with, with a, a common ground of realizing our tradition um, was born out of oppression, uh, that the institution was oppressing us, um, the institution was attempting to absorb um, up all of the the older practices. Um, what does that look like in in your day to day practice? All right, I'll start. Great. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> first of all, I just want to say, Michael, I really resonated with a lot of the stuff that you said there. Uh, um, even though I was raised Catholic. Um, you just you said a few things that I really identified with. And 
one of those is when you were talking about um, Benedicaria. I did not realize, honestly, until I was an adult, that that's really what I had been raised in. Whenever you said that you thought that the the things that you were experiencing were like normal Catholicism, no, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I completely get that. And so today I feel like I identify much more with my Catholic roots than I did even growing up Catholic because I'm looking at it from a totally different perspective. Like I'm looking at it from a magical perspective. I'm not looking at it. I mean, I don't identify as Christian. I don't identify as Catholic. Matter of fact, I think if I were really pressed hard enough, I would probably call myself atheist. And so, I mean, that's a weird, a weird intersection there between those things. But I was really raised in like a, 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 a Benedictaria, Stregonaria. I mean, that's, you know, all the weird little things that I thought were part of Catholicism were just weird little things that my family did. And I was like 40 before I discovered that. And I discovered that because I started doing genealogy research because I'm actually adopted. So my Sicilian father, that's not my biology. My biology is a weird combination of Creole and um, a large chunk of Viking and Celtic. So that's pretty different from Sicilian. But I don't identify with that culture because I wasn't raised in that culture. So I identify with the Sicilian culture and I do Sicilian things and I have Sicilian ways and, you know, I, I have this loud Sicilian family. <clears throat> but I, I mean, my family, the ones that have passed are spinning in their graves right now. <laughs> hearing me talk about this because they don't realize that what they were doing is Italian witchcraft. Most of what they did was not Catholic. It was Italian witchcraft. And I think that's why I'm able to bring it into to my life on a daily basis now, because it was my daily life growing up. And it it's not of a religious nature to me. So even though I got way away from it for probably almost 20 years because I was so turned off by anything to do with church. And like the second you miss you mentioned Jesus, I'm out. I'm still out. I, I just I can't I can't do it. But the mystical aspects of it are the parts that I've carried forward into my life today. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And and I think <clears throat> I think when we um when we really look at the history of what <clears throat> excuse me, um, John Dominic Crossan would call the Jesus movement compared to the church, they were two totally different things. There was this esoteric movement of people that were following um, not just Rabbi Jesus, but but also Mary Magdalene. Um, you know, the the prominent voices in in the uh, the culture. The spiritual culture they came from closer to the Essenes, um, where they were looking at and unpacking more metaphysical principles. Um, and you read the larger text, and you see there's stories in there about sigil work. There's stories in there uh, that that are um, you know spoken spells according to ancient formularies. Um, you know certainly a lot of divination, um, and and it's. I, it's easy when you look at that in at that big picture from a, a distance to see how the patriarchy would be so threatened and would say, no, we want all that power for ourselves. And suddenly the people who are um, embracing this in, in, on the fringes of communities throughout Italy um, are, are being told, um, stop reading the Bible. You don't need to read the Bible. Let the priest read the Bible. And so and that's where. Um, we saw the same thing happening on, on the backs of the enslaved uh, in, you know, 400 and, and some years ago um, when, when uh, uh, enslavers would say, um, no, we're going to teach you about this religion, but you're not going to learn how to read because we don't want you to read the Bible because then you're going to find out all the times we're, we're full of shit and lying to you. And, and, and really getting, you know, just telling you the, the bits and pieces that suit what we want to say. And I think, I think Benedicaria, I think um, uh, Stegonaria, I think all of that, um, certainly Santaria, um, all share that in common. It's, it's the way that the oppressed people reclaim their power.
I think Megan, it was, oh, sorry. You go, Michelle, okay. it's all you. Megan, it was interesting hearing you say that your ancestors would be spinning in their graves. And I, 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 I true story. Um, spinning. I, <laughs> just so fast, <laughs> yeah. just like a dreidel. Just right. Yeah. <laughs> what um, I I remember when I was going through, cate it's not catechism. It's not what they call it for adults. But when I was actually going through the yeah. process of converting to Catholicism, my mom said, and I and I kind of off the hand said, yeah, do you want to come to whatever they in this service <laughs> where they um actually bring you into the church and everything? And she, my confirmation, confirmation. my confirmation. She was like. Yeah. Well, I've been praying that you would come back to church. I guess my prayer was answered. <laughs> so she yeah. showed up. Um, yeah. But I don't. Um, but I don't think she ever. Could, here's the spinning in her great part. I don't think she ever could have imagined that I would be so devoted to Mary um, and the earth wisdom of who she, of who she and, and the larger uh, context in which I see Mary. Um, I don't think she ever would have anticipated my looking. And, and, and embracing um, hermeticism as part of Christian practice, she probably been like, or, or part of, or I don't know, but part of whatever it is I'm doing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think any of these things are part of what she would have foreseen as my joining the church. And frankly, the churches I was raised in, they would say, "That's why you don't become a Catholic." <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, like I, I have an aunt who she's a great aunt and she was the most devoutly Catholic person I have ever known in my life. She really should have been a nun. She never got married. She never moved out of her parents' house. Her parents were my great grandparents were immigrants from Sicily. They didn't even speak English. I mean, and this woman was just devout and she was so well syncretized that she didn't even realize that her, all of her stuff, you know, that she was so devout with really wasn't Catholicism. I mean, it really Catholicism as, it, I mean, at least not the way the Catholic church wants Catholicism to be. It was much more esoteric than that, but. but that's I mean, the thing. I, like, I mean, there's the, the, the institution that defines it, but. The capital C, right? Right. The, the capital C, but the small C is a very different. Very different. Much more profound and interesting animal. I mean, I remember, yeah. I remember being in a service and watching, you know, converting the bot, the bread to the body and blood of Christ. I'm like, yes. I'm sort of looking at it like, that's some magic shit you're doing. What, what's what the, the hell, hell are y'all doing? Wait, wait, I know. I remember. Like a and like, <laughs> like, what, I had these like questions when I was little. Doing? Like a little bitty girl. I remember one day in my in my school. I actually raised my hand and I asked a question and like, that was, that was the day the music died. Right. It was like, I never asked another question ever again, the rest of my life, because I was just shut down. I mean, that priest dragged me all of, I was all of seven years old and he just verbally dragged me in front of that whole class. And I was like, well, that's, and I'm done with that for you. But the other thing is that every okay. time you pray, you're creating a spell. Like a prayer is a spell. Yes, right. I say that all the time to people. I'm like, you can pray, you can what you can blow out the birthday candles on your cake. It's all a spell. Oh. Like, what the hell is wrong with you us? Cast Why spells are we all the time. All day long. <laughs> all day you step on a crack, you break your brother's back, whatever. That's a spell. Like it's all it's all of it. That's a curse. It's a hex. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. But don't tell my name yeah. that. I'll I'll tell you as as a uh, a retired priest and, and retired bishop, um, nothing would make me crazier than than the people, <clears throat> especially in South Central Pennsylvania, uh, the people who um, insist, oh, what you're doing, uh, any you know that's why our our ancestors would never use the word witchcraft and say that what they practiced was the craft, <clears throat> because that was what outsiders said of us. So it's interesting to see them saying, oh, you know, she's a witch. And oh, look at that Strega Bhutana. Look at that one. But, and it's always the one on the outside. But the practices that they use here in South Central Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania Dutch have um, th these German sigils that they paint on the side of their barn as part of a practice called powwow or busharai. Um, and um, they will tell you that that's just what they do to protect themselves from the witches. 
but they, they will also tell you what you they're doing. You are the not, witches. Yeah. What <laughs> they, they won't tell you that what they're doing is magic. You know, no, it's not magic. But what does it do then? Well, it protects you. Oh, like a sigil. Yeah. Well, they're called sigils. <laughs> oh, so like magic. It when I do. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Like, what's the difference in, in chanting a mantra and praying the rosary? Well, there is no difference. Those are exactly the same thing. It's exactly Usually the same, the same thing. same number of beads. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's funny because it's like we always try to demonize what's on the outside. You know, whether it's the Catholics calling what's in voodoo demonic, you know, whether it's the Protestants calling the Catholics the idol worshipers. Um, but really, we're just using different words for the same shit. Like, you know, like, it's just like we're all doing basically the exact same things. It's just that it's about othering other people than rather seeing where the commonality and the intersection lies. And I think kind of the beautiful thing that we're seeing in kind of our culture right now, especially with um, the, the earlier, the newer millennials and the Gen Zers, um, is we're seeing all that really being crumbling down. You know, we're starting to see people come back into their practices of their childhood um, at really young ages. Like, you know, we're talking about people in their early 20s um, who are really reevaluating their cultural practices and trying to reintegrate them um, outside of the context of the institutions, you know, really trying to really grasp that again, because I think we've all been thirsting for that mysticism, but because we're so traumatized by the institution and the church and the temple and like all their craziness, you know, it, it's 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 really refreshing to have these things again and then say, well, I don't have to deal with you to access any of this. I really don't need you. If I had only known at 12 years old that I could have told the Catholic church, the hell with all of this. And exactly, and and like just done it anyway, I probably wouldn't have, have converted, but it's, I think for a lot of us, it's the journey that we have to walk. It's like, you know, I had to convert to get to the place where I am now. Um, Megan, you had to walk away from it to really come back and reappreciate it. And me and Michelle share that really common, um, that common bond there of like, you know, having to enter into the into that institutional framework to be like, you know, a lot of this is just bullshit, like, you know, but there's some great shit, like, you know, underneath underneath the surface there. Um, and I think even those of us who are involved in different liberation movements, um, the LGBTQ community, like, you know, there's so much LGBTQ lore in Catholic folk legend that we were never taught, the Madonna di Montevergine, um, which is, so unknown outside of her quarter of Italy, like, you know, but it could be so empowering to people. Um, St. Wilga Fortis, I think there's, it just, the list goes on and on of what we can talk about, which is so empowering that the institution has either hidden from us or just kept under the covers um, that's all really bursting towards the seams. Yeah, absolutely. Melissa, I, I'm anxious to hear some of, uh, some of your thoughts. Yeah, so uh, small world. I too am uh, Italian and Sicilian and Spanish. And my mother is a Sicilian national. I was born in the United States. And, you know, my experience with Catholicism was quite secular because uh, my entire experience with, with Catholicism was here in the United States. And it, it's, it's felt very you know, dry and non-religious and almost like it's very well, white bread. <laughs> very yeah, very Protestantized, I, I would say, maybe. Even the Catholic churches uh, you know, have a very sort of waspy vibe, some of them, uh, in the white suburbs. And I would think that uh Catholicism is, you know, as I've experienced it, is a is a religion to leave if you actually want to be religious. And in fact, I think that people who who choose religion or choose spirituality might might have a, an exodus away from Catholicism. Uh, but I, I'm also I've also heard some stories today too, but overall folks gravitating toward Catholicism, like converting in or, or finding something very sort of spiritual and uh, joyous and inspiring about it. But it does seem more like you know when these magical and mystical elements are 
add it in. Uh, the time that I spent in Sicily, uh, we had, I, you know, beautiful processions at times uh, connected to saints, you know, saints days and, and saint worship. And you can see how, uh, whether it's, I, I won't call it like holly theism per se, but let's say just a general sort of poly worship uh, seems, you know, very attainable, uh, you know, in those kinds of towns with those kinds of ceremonies. And also, you know, to kind of go off of what Megan was saying too, some of this stuff, you know, that we think about as superstition uh, is sort of sitting around the side of religion and you're not really so sure where uh, the biblical aspects and the religious aspects connected to Catholicism begin and some of the superstitions and really like superstitions being like beliefs related to craft, like where those begin and end. It's, it's sort of open at the edges and the religious Catholics don't seem to care about that, that I've experienced in my family. Whereas the secular Catholics kind of want to be divorced from all of it and enjoy instead having a very sort of atheistic or agnostic identity. Yeah, I think I think those are really great observations, especially when we look at the um, at what's happening on a, in a in a cultural context. We're seeing more people, <clears throat> excuse me, moving away from um, dogmatism, um, you know, uh, doctrinal religion, uh, both within the within Catholicism and outside. And you know, as somebody who who uh, you know entered the seminary at sixteen. In fact, next week is going to be 19 years that I've been a priest. Um, it'll be 40 years that I've been a Franciscan uh, that, that I took uh, took vows the first time uh, on on the 3rd of October. And so I look back at at sort of, you know, what kind of impact did, you know, have I had on the people entrusted to my care? And all I could think about is St. Teresa um, of Avila, who would say, um, you know, the church is like a beautiful boat. And once it takes you across to the other shore, you should burn that boat. And, and I saw that as that's, that's my job, you know, for the, for the 19 years um, of, of service in, in that capacity was to make the church obsolete. And the way that I think that just made sense for me was growing up in a family where our magical practice was part of everyday life. So I, I wasn't even cognizant of the fact other than when I was six and I learned how to do the, the diagnosis and removal of the molecule, um, I didn't realize that any of the other stuff that was being taught from that point on was, was actually being taught, uh, that I was being taught the craft. I understood where I was being taught how to do things the way we do things. And Same. so sometimes, sometimes on Saturday, that meant you're doing, you're doing some divination with the dough. Um, you know, other times you could be playing Pokino and somebody throws a, a particular card and, you know, the, the more mystical Mosca at the table says, Oh, that card. And then uh, does divination in the middle of a card game. Uh, so, so I and I think we're at that point where people are being drawn back to the mystical, um, and they're saying, you know what, I could take the mystical, and I don't need the institution with it. You know, I, they may they may want the the dressings, the outside of the institution, so they go to a, a traditional church, but they're what they're actually getting fed in is is the the esoteric, is the magical. Any thoughts on that? I just want to say, and then I'll let Megan go. Sorry. No, you <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, I, I can say that that's been certainly true for for my practice of myself because I love some pop and circumstance. Like you know, give me some Latin and some Gregorian chant, and like you know, we're good. But like you know, at the end of the day, like you know, we're talking about to Saint Jude about how I'm going to get these fucking bills paid. Like you know, like that's <laughs> like you know that's so much the real day-to-day -day life of of my practice like you know is really making those spirit connections like you know um really um coming to the rosary especially um being a part of my daily practice really connecting with that mother energy connecting with that earth energy 
um, doing the divination with the holy cards, you know, praying to St. Lucy that um, my clients get the information that they need and that they say clearly, like, you know, that's what really feeds me. Like, you know, but at the end of the day, like, you know, who doesn't love some incense and like, you know, some tantum ergo on the side, like, you know, like that's, that's all good too. And just like Michelle said, the mass is just magic anyway. And so you're getting fed energetically from, from that also. So I see where it all intertwines and, and goes in together. Absolutely. You know, when we get back, um, I want to ask a question of everybody on the panel. I'm mindful of the time um, because I think we could probably talk for another three hours. Uh, but um, when we come back, I want to ask you a question of how, if at all, you see your conjure practice um, uh, fitting into the bigger picture of making this world a more compassionate and, and inclusive place. Um, and so we will use that as a um, uh, uh, as a, a theme when we get back because of the public service announcement that will precede it. And we'll see you guys in just a second. Hi, I'm Adrian Grenier, and I'm a guy you might know. That's why I've chosen to speak to you today, because you know my story. Well, some of it anyway. But what if you knew everyone's story? What if everyone on the planet was familiar to everyone else? The Charter for Compassion wants to find out. They're asking you to tell them a piece of your story. One moment of compassion that changed your life. Each story will be inspiring in its own right, but all of them together will reveal a world of compassion happening right now in places all over the world, as diverse as Kentucky all the way to Pakistan and everywhere in between. Imagine it. Thousands of stories told one person at a time. Someone once said, there isn't anyone you couldn't learn to love once you've heard his or her story. Stories make us care. Stories help us understand. Stories breed compassion. And if there's one thing we need right now in our politics, in our dialogue, in our communities, in our world, it's compassion. Go to charterforcompassion.org and tell your story. And while you're there, affirm the charter and make a commitment to make the world a more compassionate place. But it's only the first step. Now it's time to practice. It's the only way to a peaceful world. I can't wait to hear your story. And we are back. We, uh, we show that, that clip uh, with fair frequency because it's hard to remember to stop looking at how cute he is and actually listen to him. Um, but I do encourage everybody to uh, to consider signing the charter. Uh, it's it's uh, an, an amazing organization uh, that I, I had the privilege of working with for a number of years. So so panel, let's let's wrap this up uh, by talking about that piece that we that we um, uh, just listened to about bringing. Um, our stories, uh, because I see this as being very relevant to um, Catholic conjure and folk Catholicism and, and folk magic in general, to hoodoo, to, to the, uh, uh, the voodoo traditions, uh, Santeria, um, and, and the other Afro-Caribbean uh, religions. What, what are your thoughts on how telling our stories and opening our hearts to others um, as part of our magical practice can have as a um, sort of as a as an impetus for change in the world around us. I think it's start because I think one of the things as I've started to take part in more esoteric traditions, one of the things that's really clear that all the forms of Christianity that I've been involved with is that they, you know, that we are divine, that each and every single one of us is divine. And if we are going to really meet ourselves and meet other people in that divine place, like we are going to have to incorporate more esoteric practices because institutions do not want us to have that power. Institutions have no interest in making, I mean, that's, we have to step out of, like we're too interested in perpetuating capitalism worldwide to actually be about the business of what is divine. And I think that is what, that's what I take from my particular set of practices. Right on. 
Oh, it's my turn. We're we going in order. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, for me, I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit of my personal experience with this is being a healthcare provider um, puts me in a kind of a unique situation here because I meet new people all day long. I mean, I've got I think close to 400 pregnant women right now that are my patients. And I live in the Bible belt. Uh, my husband is military and we're stationed in lower Alabama right now. So yeah, I saw that face you made. Yeah. <laughs> um, so even before I started with this practice that I'm at, they, someone in the community had saw my Facebook and I said something about tarot card reading on my Facebook and they were like, Oh, 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 we can't bring her here. She's Satan worshiping, like in the satanic panic sense. You know what I mean? Like it was that sort of like burn her. She's a devil worshiping witch. She's going to eat the babies. She's not going to deliver the babies. And so they were really uncomfortable and really afraid of me when I started. And so I was very, very, very closeted when I first started there. And then I was like, you know, this is my identity. This is who I am. And if I can take this opportunity to educate people and have people see a normal functioning, contributing member of society who also practices the craft and conjure and, you know, hoodoo and whatever name you want to give to esoteric practices and still is an intelligent, capable human being, not eating babies, but taking care of women, um, trans women included, actually, that's a very important part of my practice for me. Um, I can tell you the number of people that have come up to me and said, you know, we thought you were really different than you are. And we were really scared of you when you first came, but actually you're great. And we love having you here and we're getting ready to relocate. And they're now really sad that I'm leaving. So they went from wanting to burn me at the stake to now trying to see how they can get me to stay. Um, and that's very powerful for me. Right on. And, you know, as a retired physician as well, I will say that, uh, uh, it is much easier to eat a baby if you wait till after they're delivered. So there's also Yes, that. you have to cook them long enough. Yes. Yeah. Tender and mild, the holy infant. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Melissa. Yes, thank you. I was going to say we need to destigmatize eating babies instead of... <laughs> reinforcing that stigma. So I don't, so I don't really have, as I said, contra practices per se, my own contra practices. Um, how can, how can they make the world a better, more inclusive place? Well, I would say that in general, whatever your spiritual bent is, whatever kinds of practices that you have, um, if it sustains you, if it increases you, if it brings you joy, peace, it, that actually resonates. It's a super sort of you know, ground up approach, very, very ground up kind of one person at a time, you know, to improve like from yourself moving outward. Uh, also in terms of my scholarship, you know, part of my scholarship as you know, is of course interviewing folks and, you know, a thousand other ways that I'm, I'm going about uh, collecting and analyzing uh, data. But part of that is actually I'm participating in and performing some of the things that I read about, you know, suspending disbelief, not really sure how I feel or what I think, uh, but, you know, to kind of put myself in positions to experience things uh, is going to increase my ability to, you know, write what I have to write in a way that's valid, in a way that's comprehensive, representative, inclusive, and fair to, in particular, uh, marginalized and stigmatized communities, which, of course, we know uh, are these are communities that we're talking about today. Right. Right on. Thank you. Michael. So I think what my takeaway from my practice is, um, first is just being a professional tarot reader, is that you learn that everybody's dealing with the same stuff. Like, you know, at the end of the day, like we are all in the same boat. It doesn't matter if they're the richest person. It doesn't matter if, if they're in poverty. You know, humanity wants the same things. You know, there's not really any difference between any of us. And I think with our esoteric practice, whether it be, you know, Wicca to Catholic Conjure or whatever else in between all of that, um, at the end of the day, you know, what we're reaching for and what we're looking for is essentially the same. No matter, like, you know, if we're calling on Odin or we're calling on Mary Magdalene, that was a weird pair to put together, but anywho, um, 
it, it, that's it's you know this is a desire of humanity to reach the divine that's within each and every one of us and it's that we're all in the same boat we're all dealing with the same issues and we're here to help each other through that um in our own specific ways that resonates with each and every one of us and it's just about bringing that together rather than just kind of othering each other and kind of pointing the finger that I feel that we'll get there. And as we deepen our practices, I think that that's ultimately the goal that we'll get to. So many more topics that I can think of from here, from everything from uh, from making our practices more inclusive, um, you know, dealing with, with um, binary gender issues and how um, Catholic Conjure has, has always been at the forefront of meeting people where they are, um, we could do another five shows. But I want to thank each one of you uh, for being here tonight. Uh, to the to the guests who tuned in, it uh, looks like we um, um, we got a a comment. I didn't see when it must have been must have been during Michael's comment. Um, who said, "Not me. I wanted you here." We don't know who that is, but. Um, I hope that um, if you're watching uh, this on the replay, or even better yet, on the cleaned up, uh, uh, finished version of this, um, although tonight's went went fairly well, um, there's not going to be a whole lot of cleanup to do. Uh, please ask your questions, post comments, share your stories, uh, and we'll all check in. Uh, that was for Megan, that comment. Um, so, so. Um, uh, we'll we'll be sure to check in and we'll see um, we'll see your questions and answer them. Megan, were you going to say something? I was going to say it must be somebody that didn't mind that I was eating babies. <laughs> must be. All right, guys. <laughs> as we say at the end of of every one of these broadcasts, we thank you for tuning in. Uh, we thank you in advance for your questions and comments and for sharing this uh, with with others. Um, like I said, this will be broadcast on. Facebook uh, Live and YouTube Live on Friday. Um, so in, until then, stay in the moment. Uh, that's where the power is. Fill that moment with gratitude. Fill that moment with awareness. And always remember the best is yet to come. We'll look forward to talking to each and every one of you soon. Have a great week.